Hello, everybody. Welcome to Virtual Thursday's Dire Literary Series live from the New England Aquarium. <laughs> and uh, tonight, our guest is Lee Matthew Goldberg. And uh, let me tell you a little something about Lee. I'm all set. I'm all set up with this. Um, well, let me tell you a little bit something about Lee, and that's not the screen share button. After all these years, after all these years, doing there he is. Lee is Matthew Goldberg is a writer born in New York City. He's the author of The Ancestors, Slow Down, The Mentor from St. Martin's Press, The Desire Card, Orange City, and the young adult series Runaway Train and Grenade Bouquet. His books are various stages of development from film and TV. He's been published in multiple languages, nominated for the 2018 Prix de Pilar. He is the editor-in-chief and founder of Fringe, which I didn't know. Yeah, I need to update that website. For Fringe wound up not happening yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So he's not that. Not, so not yet. someday, but not yet. Yeah. After graduating from an MFA from the New School, is that true? Yes. Yes. Everything else, all good. <laughs> His writing has appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, The Millions, Volume One, Brooklyn, Lit Reactor, Monkey Bicycle, one of my old favorites, Fiction Writers Review, Kagabi, Necessary Fiction, Hypertext. Et cetera, et cetera. You can read it yourself. And you're, if you're really, really interested uh, with Lee, uh, read along right now. But it's uh, LeeMatthewGoldberg.com if you want to find out everything you want to know about Lee and his writing. So, without anything else from me, I am going to turn it over to Lee. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Tim. Absolutely. Um... Yeah, we met at my reading series, Gorilla Lit, and that was really awesome. Um, and it was fantastic to hear you read. And yeah, how did what like what what do you want from me? What do you want me to do? I would like you to do the river dance. Okay. I don't know about that. Yeah. That I'm not that's sure. That's what I want. So you can read anything you'd like for about seven, eight minutes, and okay. then we'll ask you some questions. Cool. Let me give me one second. Now I'll do the river dance to kill time. Hold a second. Let's do the river dance. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to read. Um, so the the latest thing that I had come out, I had a five book series. Um, it was under the umbrella of the desire card and it was all five books. Um, so I'm just going to read from the first one. It's called Moral Origins. And it's basically about... Um, this really horrible company um, that promises its clients any wish fulfilled for the right price. Um, and it's really kind of a glorified uh, hitman operation. Um, so this book takes place in the 70s and it's the inception of the card um, through the eyes of um, one of its new members. So here we go, Moral Origins. There's a gun to the back of my head. The hammer makes a clicking sound. Whoever it is ain't fucking around. I should have seen this coming. It's either the one I fear or he sent someone in his place because he's too gutless to do it himself. Fucking bastard. Had me strip away every shed of morals and left me a hollow cave. Over the years, the blood on my palms has seeped into my love lines, my lifelines, my fate lines. I visited the graves of those I'd put in the earth. I expect nothing less than a direct elevator to hell when this tormentor finally pulls the trigger. Maybe I've been waiting for it, doing exactly the wrong thing in the hopes that I'll see the end because there's no escaping. That's what the desire card promises along with every wish it fulfills. But it wasn't always supposed to be that way. Troublemaking kid from Hell's Kitchen, sure, but mostly petty crimes. Figuring out ways to steal from the rich and give to the poor, i.e. me. Yeah, I'd spend time behind bars, but baby bars, not maximum security. Shoplifting something stupid, drunk tank. Purse snatch, drunk tank. Breaking and entering, they never proved that one. Mags and I did it mostly because we were bored. I dropped out of high school and so did he. We flipped burgers at a smelly diner on 8th Avenue, but that paid shit. Then I was fired and Mags quit out of loyalty because we'd done everything together since the sandbox. And my girl Cheryl wanted a diamond tennis bracelet because she heard some celebrity on TV yapping about her husband getting one for their anniversary. I was already planning on dumping Cheryl because I heard she got with Crazy Eddie, who fucked anything with limbs and might have given her the clap. But at the time, I'd seen this tennis bracelet out of the window at Tiffany's 
My God, did it twinkle. I figured even if Cheryl didn't deserve it, my next girl would. So I tried to swipe it and slam him. Jail time number five. Mags bagged me out with some money he lifted from his mom, and I moved back home with my folks and ailing little brother Emil, who'd spent half of his life in hospitals. Ma yelled at me to take my GED and get a job. Pop Tammy with his belt, Emil cried. I went to sleep with the left side of my body all bruised and swore I'd figure out some way to wrench my life out of the pits I'd been in for too long. And voila, Halloween night, 1978, I was dressed like Robin Hood because he fit my motto and met Marilyn Monroe, a mass wonder who led me on the path of greatness before death came lurking, to this gun poking the back of my head, to my brains Jackson Pollocked on the wall. But that night, I was simply starstruck. Should I read a little more? Do we have more time? Yeah? Okay, cool. All right, this is from chapter two. The Twin Towers, majestic along the horizon, bringing a halt to the decline of lower Manhattan. I'd heard my pop speak of them this way, the tallest buildings in the world until the Sears Tower went up in 73. Built at a time when New York's future seemed uncertain, the towers restored confidence. The Empire State sturdy like a man, the Chrysler sexy like a woman, the towers a show of incomparable mystique. The loony French dude walked a high wire between them a few years back. The human fly hoisted himself up the South Tower, I planned on taking Cheryl to the windows of the world for our anniversary, but now I need to find someone else to show off the sights. Seeing the skyline reflecting them on Halloween night, I thought that anything could be possible. Money for Emil's surgeries, really falling in love, moving out of my folks, finding a job worthwhile sinking, sinking my teeth into. Downtown resembled a wasteland, so I was surprised when we entered a factory-like space. Turns out Jack the Nose's uncle owned a toy distributor, and let Jack have the place for a soiree. Andy Gibbs shadow dancing pumped from out of the doors once they swung open. Packed house. Wonder Woman's, Sandra D's, Debbie Harry's, Chewbacca's, Andy Warhol's, New York Yankees who just won the 75th World Series, John Belushi from Animal House, Mork from Mork and Mindy, Nanu Nanu. Two Coneheads, a Superman, a Sid and Nancy couple, and about eight warring guys strutting around as John Travolta. Mag said he was dressed as an undercover cop, which really meant he was too lazy to come up with a costume. Can you dig it, he'd say to anyone who asked. Far out, if you replied. Keep your enemies close, right, Mag said, and everyone agreed cops were bogus. Who are you, a Chrissy from Three's company asked. Robin Hood? Robin Bird? She was on so much coke it had crusted around her nostrils. Hood, Robin Hood. She tapped her temple in deep thought. What have I seen him in? Your nightmares, I said, fucking with her. But then she began to cry. Mags rubbed her shoulder and led her away. Don't scare the lovelies, he said. Jack with the nose approached. I knew it was him, since his nose was really a sight. Not simply big, it had a presence, elbowing its way into conversations, boldest and red like an old drunk's, a whistle escaping from his nostrils every time he spoke. Jack, you know Jake, Mags said. He's looking for work. Really? Really, Jack the nose asked. He was wearing a big purple pimp coat and a walking stick and large tinted sunglasses. I work for Georgie. I've met Georgie. Yeah, how good are you at nabbing coats? That's very specific. We're a, a specific kind of organization. I just stole a Tiffany's bracelet from my ex-girl. Coats are a lot bigger, Jack the Nose said, and popped a cigarette between his lips. But do they have diamonds? Come down to the fish market at the seaport tomorrow night. You could talk to Georgie there. We'll find something for you. Thanks, Jack. That's real nice of you, Mag said. Jack with the nose brushed it off like it was no big deal, but it was clear he wanted adulation. Yeah, real nice, I managed to say. Go, Jack the nose ordered. Mingle. Make some new friends. That Marilyn's been eye-fucking you. He pointed his cigarette through the throngs of the party, past a heap of slosh dancers feeling each other up, to where Marilyn Monroe in her iconic white dress was having a difficult time keeping it from billowing up, but there was no wind tunnel under her feet. Clearly eye-fucking me unless she had a nervous tick. I knocked back a vodka shot being passed around and made my way over. She wore a mask, not of the plastic variety like a Halloween's costume, but as if it actually molded into her face. The hair was her own, styled perfectly, color of sun rays. A vampy sway accompanied her movements as she danced to kiss you all over by exile. Oh, baby, want to taste your lips? Want to be your fantasy? 
Did she know that over my bed hung a poster of Marilyn Monroe from Gentlemen Prefer Blondes? That I'd seen some like it hot every time it was re-released in the theaters? I didn't get along with my parents for the most part. We did love for movies in common. Maybe because you can go to a movie with people you normally argue with and no one has to speak. Maybe because movies seemed to calm Emile's fits when nothing else did. Restaurants were a no-no. He tended to throw food. He'd plant him in front of a big screen, the popcorn in his lap, and the kid would go numb. For my folks, it gave him two hours off. Marilyn Monroe, man. I was a pipsqueak when she died. So sad. But movie stars, they get to live on. Immortality at its finest. And at that Halloween party, she'd been resurrected for me, mouthing the words, kiss you all over. A whoosh of hot air pushed me towards her, and we danced before we even spoke. Marilyn Monroe doing the hustle, the bump, the bus stop, and the lawnmower were really a sight. I tried to keep up, but disco ain't my thing. Give me the Stones, the Beatles, Springsteen, and always Led Zeppelin. My door locked, a pair of um, headphones and Houses the Holy spinning on my record player, a good joint to kick in around the rain song. But this Marilyn clearly loves staying alive. So I aped all the strutting John Travolta's at the party so she'd keep on eye fucking me. I'm so hot, she finally said, and I agreed she was hot, but then she fanned her flush mask. And I realized she meant it was hot in here. There's a roof. She pointed up to the ceiling as if I never heard of a roof before and laced her fingers in mine. We ascended on a twisty staircase and popped up two stories higher on a roof with no guardrails. The Hudson River behind us, the World Trade Center at our feet like I could reach out and touch the towers, the downtown quiet and restless. The future held a much different outcome for it, how it appeared then. I'm a genie in a bottle, she said, in her cutesy voice, exact replica of the screen legend. I'm going to stop there. Wow, great stuff, Lee. Thank um, you. So let me, uh, people can put questions in the chat and I will get to them, Lee. You don't have to read those questions in the chat because that can be cool. distracting. So the Desire Card series, it's five installments. Now, mm -hmm. when you're writing five installments, are they, do the books take place in different years? Do you have the same characters? Does it go chronologically? How does that work? Yeah, so the first book takes place in the 70s and it's the inception of the card. Um, and then the rest books, the rest of the books take place in the present. So it kind of catches up. And each book is um, really focuses on a different person connected to it. So the first book is a guy joining the organization. The second book is an older member who wants to leave. Um, the third is from a client's perspective. Um, and then we get the, the perspective of like the main boss who um, is known in the series as Clark Gable. They all wear masks of old movie stars to keep incognito. But as you heard with Marilyn, they're they're quite real looking. So when you have a series like this, when you first started, are you saying hmm. like, oh, it's going to be three installments, it's going to be two, it's going to be five. And which was the hardest to write, the opening book or the final book? Sure. So it actually turned out weird. The third book was the first one that I wrote. Um, and I got to deal with a different publisher that will remain nameless because they never paid me. But um, then yeah. once we got the rights, my agent got the rights back, um, a new publisher wanted more books. Um, so then I started writing them more chronologically. Um, so yeah, it, the, the first book is is through a client's perspective. So it's like an outside window into the organization where the other books are really more about the organization itself. Um, and that's it. There'll be five. There'll be no more. Now, how does a publisher get away with not paying you? It's a good question. Um, I don't know. There always were excuses that money was coming and it never came. And finally, we settled where it was like, keep your money, just give me the rights back. And unfortunately, there's still a publisher and I'm sure they're doing the same thing with other authors as well um do you, have to sign an agreement? do you have to sign an agreement and not name them yeah kind of i mean i don't really care honestly they're called fahrenheit press so like whatever um lee has a question does a lot of your material come from your own life experience uh, no, um, I mean, the, the, especially this series, this organization is, like I said, it's really like a mob organization. Uh, and a lot was from just like loving movies from the 70s and mob films and thrillers. Um, so yeah, I, I, have a, I have a bigger imagination than from what I use for my own life. Now, does your imagination jump around? Because you've also published uh, YA Young Adult 
novels and yeah. thriller fiction. So has that moved chronologically or do you be like, okay, I feel like, uh, you know, this, you know, do you jump around with what you're writing next? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I would say I'm a thriller writer first. This, the desire series is like a noir series. So that was, you know, a little bit different. Um, and then, I don't know, I kind of never want to be bored. So if I feel like writing something outside of a thriller genre, like my young adult series, I kind of really just wanted to like, I'm a nice guy and I write like books about people killing each other. And I wanted to just write like a kind of a sweet young adult series. So it's about this girl in the 90s um, whose sister unfortunately passes away and she wants to be a rock star like her idol, Kurt Cobain. And she runs away from home to um, meet him and become a star. And it takes place over three books. And we're working on it now. I have an actress from a CBS show attached. So we're, we're in a very early process of trying to develop it as a show. Um, so that's been really exciting too. And like that didn't happen with my thriller books. So like it, it's, I don't know, it took writing YA to get there. So uh, those three books that vanished me, Runaway Train and uh, Grenade Bouquet, those are three? Yeah. Yeah. So it starts with Runaway Train. That's when she runs away. Um, Grenade Bouquet is the name of the, um, the grunge band. Um, and then uh, the last book, Vanish Me, takes place in in the 2000s and it it follows um now her daughter um and how she kind of um reacts to um what her mother was because for a minute she became this kind of idol well your uh, books and all your books seem to connect music like even the yeah. characters nico and love were they inspired by the artist nico or courtney love and uh, were you a musician yourself <laughs> no, I'm definitely not a musician myself. Um, that would be nice. But yeah, I have zero musical talent. Um, I mean, I could sing okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, Love is the daughter of, of Nico. Um, so she was 100% named after Courtney Love. And Courtney Love, to in the second book, she has a cameo. Um, so they actually meet her in the second book. Um, yeah, I don't know. I love music. Like, I, I just recently... Um, have a book that we we just sold we're in contract for and it takes place in the late 80s and it's set to like the pop music of that era so a lot of times I'm really just inspired by music and that kind of then inspires the book as well especially if I'm setting it in a different era you know about half my books take place in you know now historical times even the 90s um and then music is like a huge part of that too I listen to music when I write a lot too so that has to do with it interesting Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Robert asks, what is the genre, a novel or a series of short stories connected by the company and Hollywood masks? Um, so, yeah, it's it's five books. They're they're not short stories. Um, and then, like I said, the the company is really the through way through all the books. And it's a cast of, I don't know, 100 people over the five books. Some people in the first book come back in the last one 40 years later. So you really get to see like these people's lives throughout. And they honestly could be read in any order because of that. I think to read them in the order that they come out in is best. But I've had people read them reverse and have like a different experience or just read a standalone as well. And and if they don't want to commit to five books. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, it's these have been books I've been working on for about 10 years over the course of five books. So I don't know, I've kind of grown with them a little bit, which is, which has been cool. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm good for the moment writing another five book series. Wow. Do you write every day? Lee wants to. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm, I'm, I'm writing a new book now it's set in the thirties. Um, and it's about uh, a Jewish man. He's the only Jewish man at an advertising company and he starts noticing Nazi symbolism in some of the adverts and he doesn't know if his mind is being messed with. Um, and I'm about almost 100 pages in and I'm like really into it. So I'm writing every day. I mean, not always on the weekend, but like I'll write Monday through Friday, definitely, um, if I'm into something. Some of your stuff reminds me. I'm a big fan of the old Twilight Zone series. Is, are you a fan? Um, I remember it as a kid. I don't really remember it as an adult, um, but I remember more the 80s one. Um as opposed to, I guess, the 60s, I think the first one came out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I some of my books have some, you know, my book, The Ancestor and Orange City are both science fiction. Um, and I love sci-fi. And it, it, it's something I'm, I'm, I want to pursue more in, in, in my career as well. It's fun to create other worlds. 
Um, Paul wants to know, do you plot out your storyline in advance or dive into writing period, not knowing what will happen? Good question. Very good question. Yeah, I'm definitely a plotter. My first book, Slow Down, was the only one that I wrote um, as a pantser. Um, and that took me many, many years to write. And I never want to do that again. Um, I write screenplays too. So once I kind of started doing that, it it helped me really kind of plot my books a lot better. Uh, so I'll usually, like with the one I'm working on now, I took a couple of weeks. I plotted it where I have like a paragraph per chapter so I at least know when I'm sitting down what I'm going to be working on and that it's not just me staring at like blank space and then like the wheels start to fall off so usually around like 70 to 80 percent in the outline it starts veering a little bit and I I allow myself to go wherever it takes like I don't go against the grain with that speaking of going wherever it takes um you know, YA fiction today is not the YA fiction that I grew up with. So sure. how far can you go? Because you've got a book, Stalker, Stalker, which is a YA, YA book, and the character is, a, character is a depressed alcoholic pill popper. So it sounds like a banned yeah. book. It sounds like a banned book to me. You know what? I actually think I <laughs> I need to update my website. I think by mistake, my website master put it in the wrong case. Yeah, Stalker Stalks like a full thriller um, and the characters in her 30s. Um, but you could go really far with YA. I mean, with Runaway Train, like, you know, we're dealing with, you know, depression and suicide and running away from home and drugs and sex. And so it's a very R-rated um, series with the show if it winds up really happening we're toning it down a bit um, it's very different to show something as opposed to you know reading it and the actress is also 15 who would play the title role so there's certain things that like I'm not comfortable with her doing um, so it, it's it's a PG-13 version of of what the books are she's nicer I think that's the biggest thing it's very hard in the books and from you know her experience when she's been through, and she's a nicer kid in 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 the series. But yeah, with YA, you could really kind of do any. I mean, I would say like sex is still you know, but with violence and stuff like that, like you can go anywhere. Yeah, I remember reading some of Ned Bazzini's YA stuff and be like, wow, sure. why why has come a long way? Yeah, I mean, I think like you know, kids are exposed to so much more than like when I was a kid, even. And you know, I think like they've also grown up in like a really tough, you know, they're like post 9-11 babies and terror and, you know, political nonsense. I mean, COVID, like they've had a rougher road, I feel like, so they can handle it, you know, and yeah, as long as the parent is okay with it, then. Um, Paul also asks, what do you think of this strategy? You self-publish a screenplay as a book, not not a book book, but the screenplay itself to help promote it. Would you agree with that strategy? Um, so actually, I have a friend of mine is a director, and she started a publishing company that publishes screenplays that haven't been produced yet. So the second book in my series, uh, Pray No More, is coming out as a screenplay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like, these days, yeah, it's called screen in parentheses. I just saw the note screen play press. Um, so you could look for it that way, screen play press. Um, and it's it's fantastic. And I, mine is the second round of um, screenplays coming out. And it's a great idea because like I've written a bunch of scripts and it's really hard to get something like produced. Um, I'm working on oh, yeah. my first book right now. We have a director, we have an actor, we, we have all these people attached. The next step is producers, which is, you know, like always the hardest thing. Um, but a lot of times you work really hard in a script and then like nothing happens with it and it doesn't exist. And like her mantra is like, well, now anybody could read it. You could buy it on Amazon and we could do a reading somewhere. And it, you know, maybe a producer notices it or you're in LA and you get it to a producer. But um, I'm of the mindset, like if you've written something and you want it out there, like put it out there, like, you know, definitely have like a reader or two, like, you know, to to kind of give it a look first, like don't be your only reader. Um, but if you feel like it's ready and you've gotten good feedback, I think like publish it, you know, like don't wait for, you know, a publisher. And in all honesty, like an indie publisher versus self-publishing, you're doing all the work any honest, even a big publisher, you're doing all the work anyway yourself. So it, it, it doesn't really make a difference, like in terms of um, what you're going to put into it. Interesting, interesting take. Um, 
So who is the actress that to, uh, to get yeah. a screenplay produced, you have to have people attached to it. Unlike a book, you have to have all of the moving parts in place. So who's the actress that's attached to um, it? So her name is Reagan Revord. She's the sister on the show Young Sheldon on CBS. Um, okay. And about a year and a half ago, um, she saw my book in Barnes and Noble and loved. She loved the cover. She was with her mom, and they bought it, and she read it, and then and she contacted my people. And I had written a pilot at the time, and she was like, "Let's work together." And it was about a year of working with her team. I think we did about ten drafts um, until they felt like it was ready. And then right at the end of the year, we started sending it out. Um, we've gotten some really nice no's so far. Um, and then we had one yes with a musician, but he had some um, cancellation stuff connected to him. Um, mm -hmm. So that unfortunately wasn't going to work out, which really was a shame. Um, so yeah, it's out there and we're hoping we hear like, somebody will take it on yeah I was, I'm working on a screenplay myself right now with somebody and they teach they teach that genre so he says mm -hmm. that if you eliminate all the dialogue you should be able to follow the story do you agree with that oh interesting I've never heard that I mean I've definitely heard you want as much white on the page as possible in the screenplay like you don't want to like it's very hard sometimes for a novelist to then write a screenplay because you just put everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd have to like read. So I mean, that makes sense that, you know, but then at the same time, like because you want such limited amount of action described, um, sometimes I think if you eliminated the dialogue, it would be hard to understand what was happening in the script for the most part. I don't know. I'd have to look. I'd have to look. Interesting. Um, all right. So we'll wrap up with, you know, your website. You introduce yourself as a writer from New York City. So have you had any New York writer influences or mentors uh, from New York? Um, yeah, I mean, I am born and raised in New York City, and I feel like a lot of times the city is even if I'm not writing about it, it's like an extra character in one of my books. I write on in nice days in Central Park. I'll just bring my laptop in front of a tree. So I feel like the city is kind of infused. In terms of mentors, I mean, I grew up, I remember some of the first book. I was way too young to read them, but I love like Jay McInerney and Brett Easton Ellis and, and those books. And they were like, I mean, Brett Easton Ellis was more LA, but Jay McInerney was like very, very New York. And I feel like I was like 10 reading Bright Lights, Big City. I don't know who like okayed that. It's like a full book <laughs> about cocaine, but like, I just remember being like, I love it. Like, it's amazing. Um, so I've definitely had um, a good amount of New York influences. And then even, you know, all the way back, like Truman Capote, E.B. White, like, you know, all these great like New York writers. Um, yeah, and, and and like I said, I mean, the city, it's so many stories like colliding into one another on a daily basis. So it's, it's, it's really easy to be inspired. Yeah. Great stuff. And uh, I remember being on a lot of cocaine, reading the bright lights, big city and be like, great book. It's the best book I've ever read. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, I was, I was way too young to be doing that when I was reading it, but I remember like getting everything that was happening. Like I wasn't stupid. Like I understood what was, what was going on and that it was a book in second person. Like that kind of blew my mind. Like I had never read that before. Um, and yeah, even some of his other books, I love Jay McInerney. He's great. Great stuff. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Um, of course. Thank you so much for having me. And if you want to see some of Lee's books, these are the series of five and wonderful stuff and here's some thank Leah you. so many books so check I do, out which and thank you for reminding me I need to update my website as well <laughs> so slow down it's another musical reference actually so anyway it, it's great great stuff and uh you know Leah we never got around to discussing what it's like to host Gorilla Lit but that's for another time uh sure. that's how we met and you do a great such a great job hosting a long-running reading series in New York thank you uh, and folks that are watching the live stream, I'm going to cut you off right now. Thank you very much for checking it out. If you want to come in for the open mic, as I always say, use the link and I will, I will let you in. Uh, and Lee, thank you so much.
Thanks for having me.